Today, I'm going to talk about the perlite transformation, which is one of the most important in the vast majority of steels that we use today. And just to um, put it into context, it belongs to this uh, class of uh, reconstructive transformations. Uh, and this is the microstructure that we normally observe in an optical micrograph. Uh, and the key feature about perlite, as opposed to any of the other transformations, is that we get the cooperative growth of ferrite and cementite. Uh, and that means that the composition of the austenite does not change as long as we are in the iron carbon system. In an alloy steel, it's possible that the composition of the austenite changes during perlite growth, but essentially the carbon that is in the austenite is absorbed completely by the cooperative growth of cementite and ferrite. And of course, uh, if, you, if you look at austenite that is polished completely flat and allow it to transform into perlite, you will not see any deformation of the kind associated with the displacive transformations. So it is essential that there is atomic mobility when perlite forms. So if you look at our time temperature transformation diagram, it will tend to form at temperatures above around 600 degrees centigrade with the sort of heat treatments that we use. So perlite will form at temperatures where there is enough mobility for the iron atoms to move during transformation. Now, I've talked a, a lot about the ferritic phase in its various forms. Uh, and I need to explain just a little bit more about cementite. So we normally think of cementite as Fe3C, uh, a, a compound, because its free energy changes uh, quite sharply with composition. But actually, uh, it isn't uh, a stoichiometric compound you know, the amount of carbon in the cementite can actually change as a function of temperature. So if I take uh, cementite from a high temperature and I cool it down uh, rapidly to a low temperature and allow uh, precipitation to happen, then you will get ferrite precipitation in cementite, okay? I'm talking about ferrite precipitation in cementite. And there are some micrographs in my, in my book showing the particles of ferrite forming in cementite because the concentration of carbon in the cementite is greater at lower temperatures than at higher temperatures. It's still, still pretty close to uh, 25 atomic percent, but nevertheless, it is a function of temperature. The unit cell of cementite is orthorhombic. Uh, this is a projection of the unit cell. So I've got the X and the Y axis here, and Z axis is coming out of the plane of the diagram. And these represent the heights of atoms, the iron atoms and the carbon atoms in the lattice. So this is a unit cell, which is quite large. You can see from here. And it contains 16 atoms, uh, 12 atoms of iron and four atoms of carbon. Now, whenever you have a unit cell like this, which is a primitive unit cell, in other words, uh, you know, we only have lattice points at the corners of the unit cell, and the cluster of 16 atoms is the motif that we place at each lattice point. That means that uh, in order to restore the structure, I have to displace through large distances, right? Because a lattice vector uh, is given by that distance or that distance, and that makes cementite extremely hard because you know, if you look at these displacements that you would have to have for slip to occur, they are very large. And the energy of a dislocation scales with the square of a Burgers vector. So the larger the displacement, the more difficult it is to achieve. Uh, in the case of uh, ferrite or austenite, it would be much, much smaller of the order of 0.2 of a nanometer. Okay? So one of the major reasons for the hardness of cementite is that the Burgers vectors of any dislocations in the cementite are very large compared with ferrite or austenite. 
And this is the space group. This is an autorhombic space group. Uh, there are some glide planes, mirror planes, and uh, this is another kind of a glide plane. Because of its uh, autorhombic crystal structure and the nature of the unit cell, it is actually a highly anisotropic material with properties that vary with direction in much more strongly than ferrite or austenite. So, for example, we have the modulus of cementite as a function of the crystallographic orientation. And you can see that there are large variations, you know, uh, 50 gigapascals to um, something like 350 gigapascals. Whereas if you look at the modulus of ferrite, it, 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 it does vary with orientation, but not as much as in the cementite. Now, how do we know uh, many of the properties of cementite? Well, Umimoto in Japan in particular uh, made bulk cementite. Okay, so that's quite difficult to make, but he used the mechanical alloying process to produce bulk cementite. And here is a sample that he very, very kindly sent to me for doing some experiments. A 10 millimeter thick lump of cementite produced by mechanically alloying iron and carbon. And then of course, this is polycrystalline. So we can measure uh, the properties of cementite uh, for example, tensile strength and so forth, ductility uh, on bulk cementite. And Umimoto and his co-workers have reported many of these data. So here, for example, uh, are some of the results that uh, he and his co-workers and some others have reported. So we see the hardness of uh, cementite as a function of the temperature, and it's pretty hard at ambient, under ambient conditions, even, even with uh, alloying additions in the cementite. But it does decrease quite a lot as you go down in temperature. So if you are deforming perlite at a high temperature, then you expect a lot of deformation to be accommodated, not just by the ferrite, but also by the cementite. And in fact, in operations such as wire drawing, which I'll talk about later, uh, the cementite undoubtedly undergoes plastic deformation uh, during that operation. Now, the, this is a partially transformed sample of perlite, and you can see that it grows as nodules of these kinds, and I'll go into the details of the structure later. And this is the sort of microstructure that you observe in an optical microscope for fairly coarse perlite. Now, what is a nodule? Okay, so we define a colony of perlite as a region in which the cementite is growing more or less in the same orientation. So here's a colony, here's another colony, and another colony, and so on. But a nodule has overall a spheroidal shape, and there are many, many colonies in it growing in all sorts of directions. So here's another micrograph of a nodule, and you can see the perlite colonies uh, growing in different directions along the transformation front. But the surprising thing is that when you look at the crystallography of a nodule, even though the perlite is uh, the cementite is branching into different directions uh, as it grows at the interface with the austenite. The crystallographic orientation of the ferrite and the cementite is essentially identical inside a nodule of perlite. Right? And I explained that earlier with my analogy of a cabbage in a bucket of water, where the cabbage represents a cementite, a single crystal of cementite, and the water inside the bucket is a single crystal of ferrite, so they form an interpenetrating bicrystal. And even though they appear, it appears that the cementite is growing in different directions by branching, uh, the crystallography is almost identical within a nodule of perlite. And this means that the toughness of perlite really depends on the size of the nodule rather than on the interlamellar spacing. Because, you know, if you are talking about cleavage fracture, then you need to deflect a cleavage crack frequently as it progresses across uh, a structure. And if 
this is essentially a bicrystal, then there isn't much of a deflection of the crack by the lamella structure. So the unit of fracture is the nodule. And here is a plot of the cleavage fracture facet, the mean cleavage fracture facet size versus, versus the nodule size. And these two sets of data simply represent different cutoffs at the orientation difference that you define a nodule by. But you can see there is a strong correlation between the fracture facet size and the perlite nodule size. Uh, because the crystallography within a nodule is quite uniform. In contrast, the strength of perlite is very sensitive to the interlamellar spacing. Uh, and you can represent that by a whole patch type effect, where you know the whole patch effect really uh, defines the transmission of slip across boundaries. In the case of perlite, it defines the transmission of slip between one region of ferrite separated by cementite to the other region of uh, ferrite adjacent to that same cementite lamella. But it beautifully obeys the whole patch equation over a very large range of interlamella spacing. So here the interlamella spacing might be something of the order of 20 nanometers, and here it would be of the order of uh, five to 10 micrometers. So that's a, a very large range of interlamellar spacings. These are data which are dug out of the literature. Uh, and uh, the uh, whole patch coefficient is 174 megapascals, when the units here are in micrometers. And this is really quite interesting, that the intercept is 128 megapascals, which really represents the strength of the ferrite and uh, uh, any elements within the ferrite. Okay, so nicely accurately represents that strength. Now, if you go back in history, uh, you know, and even now there are some papers being written where they find this intercept to be negative, right? And that is because they are fitting a very limited amount of data to the equation. And this is not a free parameter. It really represents the strength of the friction stress of ferrite. So it's very easy to show that this cannot be represented by any other relationship than the whole patch effect. And I won't go into detail, but I have all that information. So far, I've described deformation at conventional strain rates. For example, uh, the um, uh, strain rate of about 0 0.001 per second, which is what you would have in a normal tensile test. But supposing that I take a piece of steel which contains ferrite and perlite, and I put an explosive charge on it and blow it up, then uh, you know a rapid deformation mode takes over in the ferrite, and you can see these mechanical twins which are in the ferrite. And the mechanical twins are not able to cross the perlite regions. Okay, uh, they might shear the cementite within the perlite, but there is no transmission of slip from the ferrite grains into the perlite regions. Now, you can use this uh, as a forensic technique. Sometimes it's not clear whether there has been a high strain rate deformation, uh, such as an explosion. So when you're investigating the cause of a sudden failure, uh, you can look for mechanical twinning within the ferrite regions to say, no, something has happened which has caused a huge strain rate uh, in the system. It could be an explosion, it could be something else, okay? But it's an indication of a very high strain rate of deformation. Now, one of the major applications of perlite is as ropes and wires. And you know the drawing operation is done uh, at room temperature, and there might be some heating during drawing, but it's not greater than about 80 degrees centigrade uh, because there's lubrication or even uh, water cooling of the dyes. So when you take a eutectoid steel, and a eutectoid steel is fully perlitic, 
and you put it through wire drawing, these are the longitudinal sections and these are the cross sections. As you increase the drawing strain, you obviously, you know, because the seam and tight lamella are not aligned, some of them will be very severely disrupted, for example, here, uh, and some of them will align along the drawing axis, which is vertical in this diagram. And if you look at the cross section, you see a huge amount of twisting going on. And there is a very good reason why we see this twisting, uh, because there develops a texture within the wire, which means that there are certain slip systems which are more operative than others, and that causes anisotropic deformation. And in the cross section, you see a lot of twisting here. As the drawing strain increases, this is about 1.5, there is stronger alignment along the axis, but it can never be perfect because our starting structure has, uh, you know, cementite lamella in many different orientations. But, you know, what is really surprising to me is that uh, we are actually plastically deforming the cementite at temperatures of the order of 80 degrees centigrade at most. Okay. Uh, so cementite we normally regard as a brittle material, but in a drawing operation uh, where you know the stress system is appropriate, you do not get uh, you you get a lot of plasticity in the cementite. And if there is a, uh, if the colonies are misaligned to the drawing axis, you will certainly get some fracture going on but the fracture gets healed by the nature of the drawing process. Okay? And that's why you're able to draw to very large strains uh, without, uh, without breaking the wire. Now, obviously, the whole patch effect doesn't apply to a drawn wire, uh, because uh, if you like, the interlamellar spacing will scale with the diameter of the wire. And using that information, uh, Embury and uh, his colleagues, uh, Fisher, derived uh, an equation equivalent to the whole patch equation. So this is the initial interlamellar spacing, and this is the interlamellar spacing after the diameter of the wire has changed uh, to a smaller diameter. Okay, So we are squeezing the wire along its diameter, and therefore the interlamellar spacing is decreasing. And of course, the plastic strain, the true plastic strain is given by the ratio or logarithm of the ratio of areas, uh, uh, which will each in turn depends on the square of the diameter. So we get an equation like this for the plastic strain. And we can make a substitution, therefore, for ZD naught over ZD into this equation and obtain an equation for the interlamellar spacing as a function of the drawing strain. So let's assume that we can simply plug this interlamellar spacing into the whole patch equation. Then you get this relationship between the strength of your wire. This is the normal friction stress that we use. Uh, this is not the whole patch uh, coefficient. It's a different coefficient because, of course, the dislocation density and many other things are changing in addition to interlamellar spacing. So the literature sometimes confuses this with the whole patch equation that I showed you earlier, but there is no comparison between the two, okay? Uh, because this represents much more than just uh, grain boundary strengthening. So this equation uh, was derived some time ago, 1966, uh, with which you could calculate the strength as a function of the drawing strain. And it works incredibly well. So these are many data that I've collected from the literature and plotted the strength versus, uh, oops, versus the exponential of the plastic strain over four according to the Embury and Fisher equation. And you can pretty much predict the strength as a function of the drawing strain of a eutectoid steel. Now, one other really impressive thing that I'd like you to notice is that we can get wires with a strength of four gigapascals. That is more than the strength of a carbon fiber. Okay, And this is steel, much, much cheaper than carbon fiber. So we, we can achieve strengths of the order of four gigapascals. 
And some of the wires uh, that go into tires, automotive tires, are of that sort of a strength. So this, these three pictures I received this morning from Beckert, which is one of the major wire manufacturers in the world. And this is how, if you sectioned your tire, uh, you would see that it actually is a composite which relies heavily on the steel mesh made using drawn politic wire. This, uh, uh, these are the spokes of a bicycle wheel, a very important components of a bicycle wheel. And they too are made of drawn politic wire, very strong drawn politic wire. And this is a composite uh, plastic containing uh, politic wire, which forms a, a crash absorbing plastic. So this is the sort of thing that would go into a car bumper, for example. Okay? So these, uh, this perlite is incredibly important. And in my previous lecture, I showed you the longest single span, uh, longest bridge with uh, two kilometers of free navigation underneath. And these cables and these cables are really impressive. They are all made of politic wire. Okay, the, 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 the cross section of this huge cable here, which uh, the, the cables are contained, um, is of the order of uh, more than one meter. I've been to this bridge and I've taken a photograph of the cross section of this cable. And these are the cables that hold, politic cables, which hold that 900 ton steel ball in the Type A 101 skyscraper to form a tune damper, which stops the building from vibrating such a lot at uh, high altitudes. So any, any wires or ropes that you see will be made from drawn politic steel. There's a huge technology actually in how you form the ropes with different strands, but I won't go into that today. Okay, let's go into some fundamentals now. Uh, so, perlite obviously is a two phase structure, and therefore we need to nucleate both the phases. But of course, we have different kinds of steels, we have hypoeutectoid steels and hyper-eutectoid steels, and as a very rough guide, it will be the ferrite that nucleates first in hypo-eutectoid steels. That means steels with a carbon concentration less than about 0.88%. And in the case of hyper-eutectoid steels, uh, you may start with the nucleation of cementite. And once uh, you get the nucleation of either cementite or ferrite, uh, they will change the composition of the austenite in their surroundings and therefore favor either the nucleation of cementite or that of ferrite, depending on which one form first. But we have really good microscopy from Davenport and Honeycomb to show this nucleation process and the establishment of cooperative growth. So this, these are the very early stages here of a colony forming and then growing, and that's another colony of perlite and so on. So there is a common transformation front here with the austenite, and if I oversimplify that, because this is just a two-dimensional diagram, then we have alternating cementite and ferrite, cementite and ferrite, and that is our interlamellar spacing. And as the ferrite grows, it, there is carbon accumulated in the austenite, and as the cementite grows, it absorbs that accumulated carbon. So the composition of the austenite essentially does not change as the perlite colony advances. It's a beautiful, beautiful system in which, you know, the two phases are absorbing in the correct quantity, the amount of carbon that is partitioned by the ferrite and absorbed by the cementite. Now, one very important fact is that to obtain a fully politic structure, you don't need to have the eutectoid composition. You can get a fully politic structure in a 0.4 weight percent carbon or in a 1.2 weight percent carbon steel. How do we do that? 
Well, uh, this was considered by Hultgren many years ago. So this is uh, the iron carbon phase diagram. And here is the phase boundary between the gamma plus alpha phase field and gamma. And this is the phase boundary between austenite and cementite. Now, normally when we teach, we say, OK, you need uh, this composition in order to form perlite. But actually, perlite can form as soon as both ferrite and cementite precipitation becomes thermodynamically possible. So if we extrapolate these phase boundaries to below the eutectoid temperature, any steel that falls in between these two curves, extrapolated curves, uh, can form a completely perlitic microstructure, okay? Whether it's 0.4 weight percent carbon uh, or 1.2 weight percent carbon, I can get a fully perlitic structure. Of course, what you have to do is you have to supercool the austenite into this region. Okay, avoiding any transformations in this gap here. So if you cool the austenite rapidly, so that transformation happens in this Hultgren region, then you will get a fully perlitic structure. Okay, um, so you, you should now be familiar with this because we've dealt with diffusion control growth quite a lot. Uh, the only difference being here is that the cementite is absorbing carbon that is partitioned by the ferrite. So the ferrite at the, in, uh, the austenite in contact with the ferrite has a composition C gamma alpha, and the austenite in contact with cementite has a composition C gamma theta, which is smaller than this. And therefore we get a diffusion flux down this gradient, which is uh, given by this, C gamma alpha minus C gamma theta, divided by the diffusion distance, which is a function of the interlamellar spacing. It's not actually the interlamellar spacing because you've got diffusion happening in both directions, but let's assume for the moment that this constant is one, okay? So this is simply the diffusion flux uh, down this gradient here, which is this distance here. So we've got diffusion happening parallel to the transformation front. And that will be equal to the rate at which, you know, as the cementite grows, it will absorb uh, carbon C theta minus C gamma theta here times the velocity of the interface. So that is the amount of carbon that the cementite absorbs as it grows. So these two quantities must be equal uh, in order to maintain local equilibrium at these two interfaces. Now, uh, we mustn't forget that we are creating interfaces and there is a cost of creating interfaces. So if this is a, a, a simplified colony of uh, perlite, where the green is the uh, cementite and the white is the ferrite, and this is twice the interlamellar spacing, then the amount of uh, ferrite-cementite interface that we have is Easy to show that that's given by two divided by the interlamellar spacing. So the energy stored in the interfaces is the interfacial energy per unit area multiplied by the surface per unit volume. So that is equal to two sigma over S. And we've got to account for that energy in our growth equation. So we do exactly as we did for Wiedmeister and Ferrite, that the effective driving force is reduced from the available driving force by the cost of creating interfaces. And if I set this term to zero here, then I get the free energy here, and this is the critical spacing at which growth will stop because all of the energy is being absorbed in creating interfaces. So I now substitute for delta G in this equation, so I get two sigma alpha theta over the critical spacing where no growth can happen. Uh, and this is the term from here. And therefore we need to scale our growth rate equation by this term here to account for the amount of energy consumed in creating interfaces. So this is the equation that we had previously. And we simply scale it by this term, this term here, okay? 
And when I plot the velocity now as a function of the interlamellar spacing, I get a curve which looks like this. It has a peak here. And, uh, you know, Zena uh, assumed that the perlite would grow at a rate controlled by the uh, perlite would grow in such a way that the interlamellar spacing will give us the maximum growth rate. Uh, velocity equations like this don't give us a unique value of S to pick, so we have to use some other condition to define when we get uh, what is the interlamellar spacing the perlite will select. And this is one such assumption, which is not always correct, but let's assume that to be correct. Okay, so um, we do not just have a flux through the volume of the austenite parallel to the interface. We may also get a flux of carbon through the interface itself, because in, in this case, you know, we've got diffusion happening parallel to the interface. Uh, in all the other cases that we've considered, diffusion was normal to the interface, so this doesn't apply. Now, it's very easy to take account of this additional flux. We just add it to the right-hand side of the equation, okay? And therefore, we can calculate the growth rate as a function of both volume diffusion and diffusion through the interface. And here we are, uh, a calculation uh, we did, where this is the curve you would get simply from volume diffusion control growth. And this is the curve if only interface control growth happened, and of course, um, these are experimental data which move towards interface diffusion dominating at low temperatures. Very logical because volume diffusion becomes incredibly slow at low temperatures. And you can see this plotted in a different way, that the ratio of the flux through the volume and the boundary increases as the temperature increases, whereas boundary diffusion becomes dominant at low temperatures. So today I've covered uh, the mechanical properties of perlite, where we emphasized that um, the toughness depends on the nodule size, whereas the strength depends on the interlamellar spacing, and the Ambure fissure equation allows you to even use a whole patch type equation to calculate the strength of a drawn wire. The only complication that remains is that we haven't dealt with uh, steels in which not just carbon is partitioning, but things like manganese or silicon, et cetera, are partitioning. And the problem becomes uh, much more complicated uh, because we now have uh, two phases precipitating at the same time from austenite. And when you have substitutional solutes partitioning, you will also get a change in the chemical composition of the austenite. So in principle, it's possible to have austenite, cementite, and ferrite in equilibrium, a mixture of austenite, ferrite, and cementite in equilibrium. And because the partitioning of solute elements reduces the driving force for transformation, the interlamellar spacing will no longer be constant. It will increase as more and more partitioning happens because the driving force decreases and we cannot tolerate too much uh, uh, surface per unit volume of cementite and ferrite. So the structure that you would see looks like this, where you start off with a fine interlamellar spacing and then you end up with a coarse interlamellar spacing. Now I can't reproduce the actual image because I don't have the copyright for that image, but you can see it in figure 4.17 of uh, my Steele's book. So this is called diversion perlite because the interlamellar spacing increases as the colony of perlite grows. Now, there is much, much more to learn about perlite, um, but not at this stage. For example, uh, very often we want to spherodize the perlite. What is the sort of heat treatment or process that would lead to rapid spherodization? Uh, we, we have um, the dissolution of cementite when we severely deform the perlite. I haven't gone into that either because that's a very big subject. So when we are drawing wire, uh, the cementite doesn't just def uh, deform. It actually starts to dissolve into the ferrite 
because carbon has a greater stability in dislocations than in cementite. So it is a huge subject, but you actually have a triangle, okay? Because it's a ternary system. Uh, so within that triangle, there are three phases completely in equilibrium, just like in a binary system at the eutectoid point, the three phases are in equilibrium, but with uh, a ternary system, you develop a gap, okay? Uh, so you no longer have a straight line, but you actually have a three-phase field under the eutectoid uh, point. But this is uh, uh, at a certain temperature or, or at room temperature? No, not at, uh, so um, uh, it's not at room temperature, okay? But if you quench the material, you will pick up all three phases. So um, it is really at uh, temperatures of the order of, uh, you know, 700 degrees and uh, going down to 650. Okay, thank you, Fabio and Harry, for your nice presentation. My question is from the industrial points of view and the impact of uh, uh, allowing design and uh, final microstructure. Uh, how uh, can affect another elements uh, alloys or microalloys, for example, for example, vanadium? to the interlaminar, interlaminar space? Hmm. Very, very good question. Uh, so there's no, no doubt that the interlaminar spacing changes when you add alloying elements because they will influence the driving force. And the interlaminar spacing uh, at which growth rate becomes zero is dependent on the total driving force. Okay, so let, let's assume that the perlite grows at its maximum growth rate, then the interlaminar spacing is related to the critical spacing, which is in turn related to the driving force and therefore to all the alloying elements that you have in your steel. So if you want to control uh, the interlaminar spacing, you can use, uh, you know, concentrations of manganese, cobalt, for example, has been used and, and so on. And it doesn't just alter the interlaminar spacing, but also the eutectoid composition. Okay. So people wanted to make uh, wires containing uh, much more carbon than 0.88%. And to do that, you have to add elements like silicon and so on, which change the eutectoid composition. Okay. Now, of course, there are other consequences to adding these elements. So uh, the alloy design has to take account of all those consequences. Is In the last lecture, I described to you interface precipitation consisting of rows of carbides forming when ferrite grows. Okay? Same thing happens with perlite, that you get beautiful rows of carbides within the ferrite and the cementite of perlite, nice arrays of uh, precipitates. And I can even show you um, precipitation of um, copper. So copper can also precipitate and strengthen the perlite. 